podcast uh, with a voice of mine that sounds like I'm a 13 year old teenage boy right now, but that's all right. We're still here and we are glad that you're joining with us at 11 o'clock today. You can come in and join us for our morning worship service. We live stream that in case you can't get out. It's at newbaptistchurch.com and you're welcome to come join us for that. On Wednesday evenings, we have a WANA for the children uh, at 6 o'clock, and we have other Bible studies at 6.30, so you could come join us for those as well. Will you join us as we're led in prayer by Carl Pemberton? Let's pray. Good morning, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day you blessed us with. We just thank you for the beautiful colors you blessed us with, Lord, as we see that you're glorified and in everything we do. We just thank you for that. Our Heavenly Father, just bless each one of us here this morning. Lead and guide us, Lord, as we walk daily with you. Bless those who are not with us this morning. They're either in homes and hospitals and nursing homes that you would just touch in a very special way, Lord. You know each one of their hearts. Our Heavenly Father, just be with our special music this morning. Be with Pastor Robbins. He brings the message this morning to everything we do. We glorify your name that we can go out and spread the gospel to those who don't know you. Our Heavenly Father, just lead and guide us, watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Carl. Now, um, Trevor, are you singing or playing? Yes. Both. 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 Okay. <laughs> Trevor is going to sing and play the guitar, and Alex is going to accompany him on the piano.
Thank you, Trevor. Thanks so much, both of you. It's kind of like sitting in on a studio recording session. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now our message is Pastor Robin. Well, it is good to be with you again here at the Radio Bible Class, New Baptist Church. I am Pastor Robin Crouch. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. And we're glad that you've joined us today uh, by radio. Uh, it is so good to have you. If you are, do not have a church home, let me invite you to join us, as Sherry has done already, uh, for our 11 o'clock service. We do ask that you wear a mask uh, right now in the midst of this. Uh, or you can join us online, and again, the link to our online service, it's uh, broadcast live, uh, can be found at our church website at newbaptistchurch.com, along with a lot of other information about our church. As we begin today, let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a leadership position uh, and been overwhelmed by the demands of the people you're leading? Have you ever craved something so much that when you went after it, you knew it was not best for you, but you went after it anyway? Well, today's lesson uh, from uh, Numbers chapter 11 speaks to those kinds of situations. Now, if you remember last week in response to Moses' prayer for help, uh, and if you remember the people had complained because they didn't have anything, they didn't have meat to eat, and uh, they were bringing all their complaints to Moses, and uh, Moses goes to the Lord and he says, you know, why did you even, why did you give me these people? And, and I didn't give birth to any of them. And why am I responsible for them? And on and on, and Moses went. And, and God said, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and get uh, appoint 70 uh, elders, uh, gather them together, who will help you govern the people. And then I'll provide meat for your people to eat. And Moses says, how are you going to do that? There are 600,000 of them. And God said they wouldn't eat meat for just one day, but they'd eat meat not one, two, 10 or 20, but for a full month until it came out of their teeth and it made them sick to even look at and all of that kind of stuff. And anyway, Moses just says, Lord, I need help. I can't do this. And so in response to that prayer, uh, the Lord told Moses to gather these 70 elders who would help him, and then that he would provide the meat uh, for the people to eat. Now, God's response to both of these situations uh, is not necessarily what you would think, but let's see what God did by reading the rest of that passage in Numbers chapter 11, starting in verse 24. It says this, I'm reading from the English Standard Version says, so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named, named Medad, uh, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Then a wind from the Lord sprang up, and it brought quail from the sea, and let them fall beside the camp. About a day's journey on this side, and a day's journey on the other side, around the camp, and about two cubits above the ground. And the people rose all day and all night and all the next day and gathered the quail. Those who gathered the least gathered ten homers. Now, that's about 60 bushels, by the way. And they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. Therefore, the name of the place was called Kibroth Hatava. 
because there they buried the people who had the craving. From Kiriath Hatava, the people journeyed to Hazaroth, and they remained at Hazaroth. Pray with me, would you? Our Father, I give you thanks uh, for this passage and for this story and for what we can learn. Lord, I pray that uh, uh, you would open our eyes and ears to see and to hear what you have for us. I thank you for the opportunity we have to just gather around your word. And Lord, sometimes these stories from the Old Testament don't make much sense or uh, we wonder about the harshness in our Western culture uh, about what God has done. And, and I pray that you would let us see this for what it is. And Lord, for uh, the way you dealt with your people in this time, but also the lessons we can learn for our time. Now open our eyes and ears that we might see and hear what you have for us. Open our hearts to understand what you have for us. And then, Lord, give us courage and our wills to obey you. I pray this in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Well, the passage begins with Moses telling the people what God has said. Moses is being obedient. God has said, Moses, go tell the people what I said. Go do this. Uh, and he's being obedient. Now, that's important, uh, particularly in the next part of what we see. Because though Moses had serious doubts about the outcome of the events ahead, he responded in obedience and followed through with the first stage of the instructions the Lord had given him. Uh, that's in verse 16 where he said, Go and gather 70 of the elders of Israel and bring them around the tent, uh, and they're going to help you. He instructed the people in that which the Lord had instructed him, Moses did. He went out from the entrance of the tabernacle to gather together these elders of the people in contrast to that, to that mob that was clamoring for meat to eat. And if you remember what happened, it was those who were not necessarily the people of Israel, uh, but the ones traveling with them, the Egyptians who started to clamor wanting uh, meat to eat and, and uh, just looking back to how, things, to how they remembered things in Egypt, which I'm sure it wasn't exactly the way it was. Uh, and that infected how the people of Israel thought. And so they all began to clamor, wanting meat to eat. And, you know, we've been out here all this time and haven't had any meat. And all we've got is this lousy manna you've given us. And so, uh, you know, uh, God is responding to that. But here, Moses, and Moses, remember, Moses' response to the Lord was, Lord, where are you going to find meat to feed 600,000 people for a month? said, if we killed all the animals we had, it wouldn't be enough. And then God says, is my hand short? Is my arm too short to do what I've said? And Moses is obedient. You see, Moses has shown his obedience, even though he had the doubts of the outcome. And he gathered the elders together. And the Lord was faithful to his promise and came down in that cloud of his, quote, Shekinah glory, and he spoke to Moses, and it says that as God was speaking to Moses, as they were gathered around the tent of meeting, these 70, uh, and as the Lord talked with Moses, he gave some of the spirit which was, which, with which he had endowed Moses among those elders that were there. Now, the language of the Hebrew text evidences that this distribution of the spirit was carried out by God and not Moses. And as such, it did not diminish the, the spirit that Moses had, but God just took that spirit and that part of that spirit, his spirit, and gave it to these elders. Now, the elders' authority was derived from Moses, and as such, they functioned as an extension of the ultimate authority endowed on Moses by the Lord. And so uh, this is setting up kind of a, uh, I, I, my words, a chain of command, but uh, throw. God has called Moses and he's taken part of what he gave to Moses to give to these to help Moses then uh, rule and govern the people, take care of their needs, all of that to look over them. And it was to take some of the pressure off of Moses. And I will tell you that as a leader at times, it's nice to have folks you can trust uh, who can take some of the pressures of leadership off of you and act in your behalf, uh, but you know you can trust them. And that's what's going on here. 
Now, uh, this giving of the Spirit to these men, again, uh, was to help was to help Moses give spiritual oversight to these rebellious people. Understand, there's still a rebellion going on. They're still hungry. They still want meat to eat, and they're still complaining. Now, the text says that the immediate impact of receiving the Spirit was uh, that the elders began to prophesy. Now, this prophesying was a sign to the people of God's gift of His Spirit and His calling on the elders. But after that one occasion, the Scripture says they did not do it anymore. Now, it wasn't, that doesn't mean that, that God had withdrawn the calling or that they were not empowered to act. It simply says that they simply were not going to demonstrate that evidence that God had given by his spirit any longer. Uh, it would not be identifiable by that prophesying, but they already had seen that God had called and had verified his call by that prophesying on these elders. But now we come to an interesting twist in this story. Uh, because two of the elders that had been chosen didn't get to the tent of meeting. So there were really only 68 there. There were two who were still back in the camp. But yet the Spirit was also given to them. So it was something that God was doing. It's evidence that this was God and not Moses. But God was doing it. And Eldad and Medad, they began to prophesy uh, in the camp. Just like the others were prophesying there around the tent. Well, when a young man heard it, he ran and told Moses, hey, there are guys over in the, in the camp. And understand, at this point, the tent of meeting was outside the camp, was away from the, the general population. And he said, they're over there prophesying. And Joshua, who, yes, it's the Joshua of the scriptures that we know, Joshua, son of Nun, who it says was was Moses' assistant from early on, since he, since he was a young man, uh, looks at Moses and says, Moses, tell those guys to stop. They weren't here. They didn't get it here. Tell them to stop. And Moses says, are you jealous for me? <laughs> and I think what he's saying is, look, what they're doing is from God. You don't have to worry about me. It's all right. Well, uh, they continue. Uh, Moses' response is incredible because Moses says not only are they doing that and it's, and it's part of what God is doing here, Moses says, Joshua, I wish the Lord would put his spirit on every person and that every person would begin to prophesy. To me, that's a foreshadowing of what God has done for those of us who followed the Savior Jesus. If that's just what happens to us when we follow Jesus. We are given his spirit. We're called to be his witnesses. We are called to share what we know. It comes to each of us. And the, the scripture says that his spirit is given to all of us. The Holy Spirit comes to us, baptizes us into the body of Christ, and empowers us to be his witnesses. So we have this calling. This is the first part of what Moses has been told to do. Well, then it's time for God to do what God said he would do, provide meat. Now, and this is an incredible story. I want you to get, to put, get your mind's eyes working a little bit because as a divine, divinely ordained wind had blown across the sea, bringing deliverance to the Israelites from the Egyptians, so now a similar kind of wind brings an unknowable, I mean uncountable, uh, just an, an unbelievable quantity of quail to blow across the camp, bringing sustenance to the faithful but destruction to the craving. Now think about that for a moment. It will bring sustenance to the faithful, but it will bring destruction to those who are craving, who just want and at regardless of the cost. A strong east wind parted the sea, and now an east wind and a south wind from the heavens descend upon the camp uh, with mounds and mounds of meat. The psalmist in Psalm 78 
described in greater detail the account of this. And then let me read just a few verses from Psalm 78, starting in verse 26. It says, speaking of God, He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by His power He led out of the south wind. He rained meat on them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall in the midst of their camp, all around their dwellings, and they ate and they were filled, for He gave them what they craved. But before they had satisfied their craving, while the food was still in their mouths, the anger of God arose against them, and he killed the strongest of them and laid low the young men of Israel. The magnitude of the quail is measured in three ways. I just want you to think about this. The breadth of the distribution, a day's journey in every direction from around the camp. Someone has said that's about 400, it would encompass about 400 square miles. That's unbelievable. But a day's journey was about 12 miles, 12 to 15 miles in every direction. But the depth of the piles of the mounds of birds says that they were two cubits, means you had birds on the ground three feet deep as far as you could see. And the amount of the individual collection said the one who collected the least got 60 bushel. And then it says not only were they eating it in the present, they were eating some for their sustenance, but then some were laying them out. They had been put out to dry uh, and to preserve them so that they might have them in the future. Uh, that's just an incredible amount of birds. Some uh, soon uh, came uh, soon after the people started their uh, their their gluttony, eating all this meat. I mean, now I can imagine they hadn't had any meat for a couple of months, and now they are going at it. That gluttony, the Lord unleashed His wrath against them, and sent a severe plague. They killed many of them. Now the reason for this is clear in the statement that the place where this happened was named, which was Kirbroth, Kirbroth Hatava. And it, that literally translates to graves of craving. Think about that. Graves of craving. Because there they buried the people who had craved other food. Their sin was in effect a rejection of the Lord and his bountiful provision in favor of an unbridled appetite. What they were saying is, we want what we want when we want it. And God said, okay, here it is. And here's more than you ever wanted. You can have your unbridled appetite or you can trust me, but you can't have both. As Paul later said of the enemies of Christ, their God is their stomach. No doubt terrified by their experience there, the people moved on to Hazareth. So they named the place where they had to bury those who had died because of the plague, those who had craved, just ate and ate and ate and ate. And we don't know whether they died from overeating, whether there was something uh, that the birds had eaten that was poisonous. I mean, there's all, kind, you can, all kinds of speculation. No one knows. But we do know that they buried a bunch, and they named the place the Graves of Craving. Those who craved died here. And I can imagine that they wanted to get away from there as soon as they could, so they went to Hazareth. Now, what kind of lessons can we learn from this for ourselves? Well, first, in that first part that we talked about, although Moses complained, he did so reverently, seeking God's help and not defiantly. Uh, God was, uh, I don't think Moses was shaking his fist in God's face and and, and, and being defiant, I think he was saying, look, I am worn out. Can you give me some help? What am I going to do? I didn't sign on to handle all of this stuff. He listened to God and was obedient even when he had doubts about the outcome. So for us, when we go to the Lord, we need to do so in an attitude of, of reverence. Seeking God's help, but not being defiant, not shaking our fist in God's face. And when we hear, we need to be obedient, even though we may not 
understand the outcomes or even believe the outcomes are possible. But a second lesson is this, that when we seek to fill our own appetites, craving and lusting after things of, of this world, well, that's just simply wrong, and it's going to lead to destruction. Giving way to the lusts of the flesh, as the scriptures call them, arouses the judgment of God against us. Sometimes our cravings, when not controlled, lead us into great trouble. I don't know uh, how many of you have ever uh, been to a Farrell's ice cream parlor. I don't, I don't even know that they're still around. Uh, but there was one in Louisville when I was there in seminary. And, and Farrell's, uh, it was an experience uh, to go to Farrell's. But they had uh, one item called the zoo. And it came out in uh, a bowl about like uh, the salad bowl at, at Olive Garden, about that size, full of ice cream and all the toppings. And if you could eat it by yourself in a certain amount of time, it was free. Well, we were there one night. Now, we weren't doing a zoo. We were just having some ice cream. And, and in came a kid uh, with his parents. And evidently, it was his birthday. And his wish was to eat a zoo. And so they brought it. And he sat down. And he dug in with both hands. He went at it and went at it and went at it. His eyes obviously were bigger than his stomach. But he went at it and went at it. And then he got sick. His, gra his cravings got it, about three quarters of the way in. His craving got the best of him, and rather than a birthday hero, <laughs> he was kind of an embarrassed and defeated young man. Be careful about trying to fulfill your appetites. Finally, complaining about what we have and craving other things we think will satisfy us is a sign we do not trust or appreciate God's provision for us. One of the most misused scriptures and promises in scripture is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The context of that promise is being content in whatever circumstances we find ourselves has nothing to do with feats of strength. Whether in want or in plenty, I can be content. So let's learn to be content with God's provision and not crave those things that only lead to the grave. Pray with me, would you? Our Father, I give you thanks. I thank you for the truth of this scripture. Teach us, Lord, to trust you, to be satisfied with your provision for us. And, oh God, let us learn to help one another. Let us learn to correct. But, oh God, let us learn to follow you and to be content where we are. We pray this in your name. Amen.